Today I'm going to be making a toasting fork that really doesn't look like a fork at all. Hi, I'm Dennis Rochette and welcome back. Today I'm going to be updating a style of toaster that I grew up with. We had a regular toaster, of course, for sliced bread, but my mom used to make this really dense cake that used to toast beautifully over an open fire. But the problem we had was that you couldn't slice this cake thin enough to get it into the toaster. So my dad used to take a coat hanger and bend it up into something that looked like this and then we could just hold it horizontally over a burner or a fire and rest the cake on top of that. It wasn't very decorative but it worked great. And then years later when I started blacksmithing I made this toaster and you can see how it is basically a fork where the tines have been wrapped around to form a basic rack to hold the cake over the fire. In today's video I'm going to be updating that once again because our needs have changed again. We don't have a barbecue anymore so I need to make a bigger one that we can use to toast hamburger buns and bagels and you know that sort of thing. So that's what I have for you today and um, hope you find it interesting. Today I'm going to be forging this toaster out of two pieces of flat bar. The tines are going to be made out of a piece of quarter by half inch flat bar that's 16 inches long. And the handle is going to be made out of a 14 inch piece of quarter by three quarter flat bar. I'm going to start working on the end of the bar by forging the connection between the handle and the tines. And the reason I'm jumping ahead here is because it is going to take a little bit of time for this to make sense. This connection is going to have two decorative arms that are going to come off either side of the bar. And I'm going to leave a square tenon in the middle that's going to make the actual connection between the tines and the handle. So this is where I'm heading. All of this is going to get cut and shaped out of the end of the bar. It doesn't look like much, but... It proved to be a lot harder to get those arms bent away from that center th tenon than I thought. And what you're looking at here is my third attempt at it. So to prepare for this, I've marked the overall length that I need for the handle on the bar. And if I need to cut something off, I'll be able to measure how much I'm removing. And I'll just move the center punch mark for the cut line of the handle back by that amount. And I'll just keep repeating that process until I get one that works. Step one is to punch a hole just a little ways back from the edge. It really doesn't make a difference where it is. Uh, this is roughly an inch. The other reason I left the bar long is because it just makes it so much easier to hang on to while I'm doing all this work at the other end of the bar. Before I go ahead and split this bar into a fork shape, I'm going to take a punch and drift this rectangular hole into a round hole. I normally do this anyway when I make a fork just to create a nice transition between the base and the two tines. But this time I'm doing it to move the material off to the side and give me the space that I need to create that tenon. This is a really nice way to make a smooth transition at the base of any fork shape, but it does leave you with a couple of ragged edges that will turn into coal shuts if you don't file them out of there.
Here I'm going to be using a narrow cross peen to fuller the end of the bar. I'm trying to make this section as wide as I can so I have plenty of room to cut out the tenon. This also is going to help to move those outside radiuses further down the bar. And then of course I'll turn the bar around and do the same thing on the other side. In this example I can show you a couple of mistakes that I made. The first one is instead of concentrating on the area that I needed to work in, I decided to go ahead and try to hammer these tines out into a flat shape. You'll see me turn my hammer around to do that. And that worked okay on the one side as long as I was hammering away from me. But the second mistake that I made is I didn't turn the bar around to hammer the other side. And then I continued hammering the other tine on the other side. And you can see how this slight change in angle is creating a totally different shape on this side of the bar. Now, in this example, I caught it in time. But if I had continued, you can see how that would develop into a really sharp corner on the outside where I don't want it. And this can happen anywhere. This is a different example, but the same thing happened. I created a stress point by making this shoulder a little too sharp. And anytime you do a lot of hammering in a situation like that, all the stress goes to that corner and causes it to fracture. And this is really easy to do when you're working in a confined area like this. And you will notice in this video that this problem seems to appear and disappear in different clips. And that's because some of the better clips that I had to use were from forks that didn't make it through the process. So to avoid this problem, hammer one side at a time and leave the tines in a V-shape. And you'll see how that'll simplify things in a minute when I saw out the tenon. Here you can see the thick square corners that were created on the tines because I tried to hammer this detail flat too soon. It isn't going to affect the overall look or the strength of this detail, but it does mean that I have to do a lot more hammering in that area than I would like. Now that I have some room to work, I can use a narrow fuller to continue pushing this detail around the corner. I've modified this fuller so it has a chisel shape. I have the flat face of the fuller up against the tenon and the edge of the fuller is working right at the base of the saw cut. And it's doing a great job of maintaining that round outside edge that I need to keep the tines from breaking. Here I'm using an anvil block with a very sharp edge and I'm using a hammer that has a really rounded radius on the outside edge. So that allows me to work right into the corner without creating a pinch point. From here on in the handle is just a lot of basic forging. I need to create a couple of offsets that are going to define some transitions between the area that's going to be the tines and the actual handle of the tool and then it's just uh, fullering and flattening and shaping. Here I'm looking for a place where I can try and forge the transition back into the handle but the outstretched arms are preventing me from getting to the near side of the anvil so I'm going to have to fix that. I finally decide to just go with a narrow anvil stake. I'm going to be staying with a pretty classic colonial design and they really liked strong transitions between all of the elements. So I'm going to have a wide strap coming out from the tines. That's going to narrow down to a square peg and then it's going to widen back out to a wide strap handle. Here I'm working on a really rounded corner of my anvil with the cross peen just to give that transition a little more shape.
And here I'm doing the same thing, working on a curved edge on the far side of the anvil to blend that transition back up into the handle. Here I'm using an anvil block to hammer a beveled surface on the top face of the handle. Here I'm getting ready to work on the tines. I need to find the center of this bar because that's going to be the location of the tenon. And I'm also going to use that point to measure from to make sure that both halves of this bar are the same length. The finished length of each arm needs to be about 14 to 16 inches. So I've set up a pair of dividers to let me know when I've gotten to that point. Forging out the tines is pretty straightforward. I usually start by working at the end, get the finished dimension that I want there, and then I work down another section and get that section to match up with the section that I finished. And I keep working down the bar that way until I get to my finished length. I find that forging a taper in sections, starting at the narrow end and working back to the wide end is the best way to go about it because the measurement that you're looking to work towards is always sitting in front of you. So the area that you're hammering always needs to be thicker than that point. You will most likely need to reforge certain sections to make them a little thinner to correct the taper, but you're never going to wind up with a situation where you have a section that's too thin and you have no way of correcting it because the measurement of the section that you're working towards needs to be wider. So here I'm quite a bit further along. I'm happy with the shape of the taper. It's a nice gradual taper. There's nothing uneven about it and I'm just under my mark. So I'm going to leave this side the way it is for now and I'm going to repeat this process on the other arm. After I get the other side roughed out, I'll be able to do a cleanup pass on both arms and bring them right up to the same length.
The last thing that I need to do to this bar is to cut a square slot for the tenon. And of course I will need to straighten the arms back out and re-establish that straight shoulder before I can attach the tines to the handle. I'm going to be shaping the tines by wrapping them around a scroll form. This is my number four scroll form and I use it probably the most because it's that classic nautilus shell shape. If you're not familiar with my scroll system, I'll have a link to the videos in my description as well as other related videos. I'm going to work both ends together because they need to meet in the middle. So I'm going to work progressively to that point because it's a little easier to tighten the scroll by simply wrapping it around the form a little bit more. But to unwrap a scroll and get them even is a little more complicated. Here I'm working on a different scroll form. It's still my number four scroll. It's just the next size up.
Once I get all these last minute adjustments completed, I'm going to give it a good wire brushing and I'll put it in the oven and I'll season it the same way I would a cast iron frying pan and then it's ready to go on the wall.